Hello, I'm Les Orchard. Uh, I work for Mozilla, which are the folks that make Firefox, but I do not work on Firefox. Uh, but what I do work with a lot is the cloud. And by the cloud, well, I'm going to explain what I mean by the cloud. But PenguinCon 2015. First, the, the topic of my talk is the cloud is your free hobby computer, which is kind of a sensationalist title, but I'm going to kind of tease the title apart and tell you exactly what I mean by that. Uh, so the first part of that, the tease apart, is what is a hobby computer? And I'm sure some of you are more familiar with this term. From the mid-70s, around the time I was born, you could get home computers with kit form. And that meant you got a printed circuit board, you got a bag of parts, and you got a soldering iron, and you put together your, your Altair or whatever. Yeah, Altair, yeah. And uh, this thing is really cool. This is, if you can, I think you can kind of see the faded background image there. Uh, this guy named Lumiere Vanek from the Czech Republic hand built this hobby computer. I mean, he didn't hand build the chips, but he, he ordered all the parts separately, he invented his own kit, hand wired everything. And if you can, you can barely see it, but the, the membrane keyboard at the bottom is actually handmade, hand lettered. He took, uh, I forget exactly what the materials are, but he built his own hobby computer membrane keyboard <coughs> from scratch. So that's pretty cool. And on the, the web today, there's kind of like, virtually speaking, a spectrum of that, where like you're either programming it yourself or you're putting it together from parts that are already made and meant to go together. And so I'm kind of going backwards to the title. So the cloud is your free hobby computer. So we know what a hobby computer is, what's free? Well, there's a couple of meetings of that, as I'm sure many of you in this audience are well aware. Free as in beer, free as in speech. Um, and so when I'm talking about a free hobby computer, I think it's crucial to think about both meanings of that. Like, sure, you don't have to pay any money, but are you getting yourself into something that's going to limit your freedom of expression with it? Like, will your efforts only serve the ecosystem that you're not paying for? So you don't have to pay, but you'll never get to use what you learn from this system anywhere else. So you've kind of, you've paid a cost, even though it's not money. And then what's yours? And that ties into freedom of expression and, and free as in beer, which is, uh, I've heard it said, if you can't fix it, you don't own it. So if you can't open the hood, you don't own it. And I'd also say, if you can't pick it up and carry it away, it's not yours. I mean, that, that doesn't apply to houses, because they're real heavy, but, but sure, if you get the right kind of truck and crew, you could take your house somewhere. Um, but there are systems where you can spend a lot of time using it for free and you'll never be able to leave with that stuff. It won't work anywhere else. You might get sued if you try to, to replicate it somewhere else. Um, so it's only yours if you can fix it and if you can take it away with you. And then what's the cloud? Well, this, if you can read the, the background image, I think is a great explanation of the cloud. There's no such thing as the cloud. It's a buzzword. There's not this like amorphous, anonymous thing. The cloud is just computers that other people own. Uh, and so when I talk about a free hobby computer that you can make out of the cloud, what I should really do, I should really rename this talk to borrowing other people's computers for your hobbies without paying any money. <laughs> but that's too long, it's not very snappy, and but anyways, if you keep this in mind, this is what I'm talking about. It's trying to, you can balance what you do with your hobbies. You can learn things, you can have some fun without paying any money as long as you pay attention to what are the, the, the pros and cons of each thing. And what I'm gonna do in this talk mainly is I'm gonna, it's more a conceptual thing than, than like a heavy tech talk. I'm gonna kind of breeze over a few cloud services that I've used and kind of point out using this framework like what I thought of it. And the first one is GitHub. This is kind of like the darling of, of cool kid open source right now, and, it, and for good reason because it's well, the, one of the first things you want to do when you when you start playing with the cloud is find a place to put your stuff. And your stuff could be your code, it could be uh, documentation, it could be you know your website. And <coughs> GitHub is a pretty decent place to put things right now. It's kind of the uh, it's kind of the social network for code. Uh, you can kind of squint at this profile page and it kind of looks like a Facebook page. Like you got 
stuff about me, and then the stream of stuff I'm doing. Um, and so there's some cool things that, that I've personally been playing with. Like one of the, one thing I did is a literal hobby computer. I mean, you don't assemble a Raspberry Pi, but this kind of fits the modern definition of a, of a hobby computer. You get a Raspberry Pi, you assemble a bunch of fun wires to it, you try an LCD screen, things like that. Um, and so one of the first things that I noticed is when I played with a Raspberry Pi, I would often nuke the SD card, so all my work would go away. So then I realized, actually, a Git client, where the, the Git binary is fit on a Raspberry Pi, so I hooked up my Raspberry Pi to GitHub, so now I've got a free, fairly safe place to put all my code while I'm playing with my hobby computer. Um, so to go to the, the what's yours, what's free, all that stuff, that I started off with, GitHub is based on Git, which what's nice about that is uh, every time you clone a project, you basically get uh, a backup of it for free. So even though GitHub is someone else's computers, you can take your work with you and go somewhere else with it, even if it's just your own computers at home, not internet, on the internet. Uh, another neat service that GitHub has is this thing called GitHub Pages. And as it says there in the headline, GitHub will give you free web space. So I can go from developing my projects for my Raspberry Pi to developing a site to show them off with videos and all that. It's still not paying a dime. So, and what's cool too is it's not any kind of proprietary technology, it's just a web page. How and I can use Git to publish it. How much advertising do you have to put up with? Well, that's the other interesting thing is none. It's totally free. Totally free service. So how much space are you allowed? As far as I understand, it's practically infinite. I think that there are some limits where if you, you know, say you upload several gigabytes, you might get an email from GitHub staff saying, please don't do that. Traffic? I think that's pretty close to infinite, too. They just don't meter it. How about and what's their business model? So that's, so that's a very good question, because the other side of free is what's the catch? Like, why are they doing this stuff for free? And for GitHub, the case is they want to convert you into a paying member. So but if it's all free, what's the, what's the incentive? Well, at a certain point, in GitHub, it's interesting, and I guess GitHub does make money with this, the incentive <laughs> is you would like to go private. Meaning, when you get on GitHub, everything's public. So all your code is out there, which is great for open source, but if you're in a corporate environment and you suddenly want to have private code, proprietary code, you pay for that. And it turns out that's actually pretty lucrative for them so far because you'll have people who, like me, start using GitHub in a hobby sense, then I infect work with it. I say, hey, there's this cool GitHub thing I'm using, and then we start using it for our in-house projects. That's not actually a concern for me these days because I work at an open source company, but I know some people that work in corporate environments work for their team, they'll go private and they'll pay a monthly fee for the space <coughs> and the hosting. <laughs> so it's, it's really like a uh, almost advertising. They really want to get everyone hooked on the free service so then when you want to use it, industrial strength, that's when you start paying. But for hobbyists, you never really have to worry about it. Let's see, GitHub pages. Yeah, so this was just one of my uses of GitHub pages is I started working on the video game on the web and I wanted to throw it up somewhere on the web to show my progress. And what's nice about GitHub Pages is you just create a, like a little port, like partition of your project, a branch, and you push code there, and it shows up on the web. Um, and I haven't paid any money for any of this hobby stuff. So yeah, so GitHub. So, so what you put up there has to be hobby related. It can't be a business. Uh, um, you can't run your business using I think you, I think they're they're just really very loose about it. I think I think you could. I think there are people. Who, well, this yeah. is hobby. This isn't business. Well, this is about this yeah, is about um, my hobbies. Yeah. Loose today. Loose today. Yeah. So I think so far they've been very. I don't know if I want to call them kind of like an optimistic company, but their thing is basically like, please don't get that. Don't use our resources. It's basically their model right now, um, and it's worked for them so far. Has the Chinese hacking changed any of those policies? You know, I don't know. I think they, 
And so the Chinese hacking thing is it was the uh, someone had hacked the firewall so that loads of Baidu hit GitHub, right? It's that hacking thing. Because they were getting a denial of service attack yeah. for a while. Um, no, I think their main response to that was to just kind of try to weather the storm. So they haven't like cracked down on people's actual usage of the site. Um, which, yeah, I mean, it's, if you, as you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch, so you really have to wonder, like, how long are they going to keep this thing free? But so far, they have enough conversions from free to paid that it funds the whole thing. Um, so this is kind of my summary slide of GitHub, where I want to I want to look at the sur I'm looking at the service in terms of the opening slides I had about yours free, the cloud, etc. Um, I like GitHub because it's, it's based on Git, which Git itself is free as in speech. Git is a tool that the uh, Linux kernel uh, maintainers use to track changes in that source code. You can download the source code to Git. You could, in, you could build your own GitHub if you wanted to, and people have. And your code and its, its storage is totally transportable. So you can go from GitHub to another service almost, basically as easily as changing a single URL in your project configuration. So you can just switch from GitHub with one command, which I think is is kind of the epitome of what I want to see in this cloud stuff. And of course, I, like we were talking about, GitHub is free as in beer. Um, it seems pretty generous, but it, it's their kind of their scheme to get you hooked and to use their professional product. But as a hobbyist, it's just I've got like 200 projects on there right now. They're just little tiny things but I don't have to pay for any of them. And like I said, your stuff stays yours because Git is such a, such a fluid tool. You don't have to do anything to your code to make it work in this system. You can move it wherever. And GitHub is very hackable, which is what I'll get into in the next few services I talk about. Uh, that's in the, the hobby computer sense, if you remember the the machine from the beginning and, and assembling your Altair or whatever is, is, virtually speaking, these services that I think are the great ones can be wired together. So that you can buy off-the-shelf chips and wire them together into your own computer. You can take these off-the-shelf cloud systems and plug them into each other to kind of make your own cloud computer. And so that's kind of the, the thesis of this whole thing. And the only downside that I can really think of is Git is hard. Git is not a user-friendly system to most people. It's kind of its own universe of terms and conventions and things, but it's one of those things that it's worth the learning. So I almost kind of want to say that's kind of an up-down though, up, because that's also part of hobby computing, is playing with stuff that doesn't necessarily have a manual. This does have a manual, but it's, it takes some learning. So then speaking of the hackability, my next favorite service is Travis CI. And the CI stands for Continual Integration. And the intended purpose of Travis is to take your code and run it along with tests you've written. Um, and I just kind of got a screenshot of it here. You can't read anything. But the idea is, is that web game I was writing has tests. And what Travis will do is it will spin up a temporary Linux machine, grab my code, run all my tests, and then tell me whether they passed or not. Um, and the really neat thing about this is I can wire this up to GitHub so that every time I push out a change, Travis gets notified and automatically does its magic and runs all my tests. Um, what's even cooler than that is one of the things GitHub enables is collaboration. So someone can suggest a change to my project with what's called a pull request. And that also wires to Travis in that GitHub pull requests will kick off a test run. And then I can see whether this contribution to my project already passes my tests. So kind of along the, the hobby computer theme here, I've got one chip in GitHub and I've got another chip in Travis CI and I can link them together on a, on a bus that they both understand and now I have a hobby computer shared between these two services from two different companies. Another neat thing that you can do with Travis CI, I've previously mentioned GitHub Pages, I can host my own website. 
I can also make it such that my website automatically updates when I pushed in code <coughs> that passes all the tests. <coughs> so now I've got this kind of, I've got the start of this Rube Goldberg machine where I push a marble here and it goes through the tests and eventually ends up in a website and that automates a whole bunch of <coughs> things that I previously had to do by hand. What kind of tests? So what's interesting about that is it will do basically any tests you can write that run under Linux. So it will do, like for instance, my web game is JavaScript. It will load up a, a, an automated web browser that will run all the code and run all the tests. We have other projects at work that are Python based. So they'll actually load up a Python interpreter, run all my code, run all the tests. Um, I want to say we have a few C++ projects that work that way. Basically anything that you can run under Linux. That's what I think is kind of amazing about Travis is it loads a full on Linux instance for you to run whatever you want through it. And that's another one that like I'm amazed it's still free. <coughs> but it's the same model as GitHub where I think they do put some limitations on you, like uh, I think there are, actually, let me get to the next slide, I can actually explain that. So yeah, Travis CI, freeze and beer, just like GitHub. Works with GitHub, so it's very hackable, you can wire these services together. Uh, runs your tests and other code on demand, so that's, that's really cool. You can, it run, well actually, I think, actually the thing I emphasized here in my notes, it runs your tests and your code. It's very agnostic as to what you want to run through it. So you don't have to necessarily use their proprietary framework or anything. They, you just tell it where your code is and it runs it. Uh, that's one of the limitations. And the only downside is I think it only has maybe two or three, maybe four uh, machines allocated for the free tier. So during usage hours, you might wait 10, 20, 30 minutes before your tests finally get through the queue. And so you can pay for Travis, and that's when you get access to more dedicated hardware. Uh, but as a hobbyist, you can wait. If, you don't, if you're not paying any money, you can afford to wait. Yes? I saw a script back there. Uh, what, uh, what would you test? What, what, kind of, what does this do? Like, does your script run, or what? Um, so this code in particular, it's glue code that you can't read it, it's totally too small. But what this does, this is my, my Travis GitHub page integration. And what that'll do is that actually doesn't run a test. That runs, um, it does some, some Git dance to take my latest commit and move it into the GitHub pages branch to publish it. But in terms of what it will run, it will run anything from uh, a make file to a bash script to a Python code, whatever you want to run, it'll do. It'll even, uh, some of our projects at work are, use, I don't know, like several dozen Python modules, some of which have C code behind them. It'll do the whole build step. It'll build all of the C extensions, it'll pre compile everything that we need to do, and it'll run whatever script you want. Does that, that answer your question? <laughs> Could I ask you to increase your volume sure. just a little bit? Thank you. There's also still seats up closer. When, when you publish, uh, do you have to have a license for your software? Um, it's recommended, but it's that's kind of loose too. I mean, it's a. Uh, do you mean a license as in? Is it assumed that it's public domain? That, that is an interesting question. So on GitHub... Yeah, you said everything was public on GitHub. Yeah, on GitHub, your co unless you're paying, your code is all public. There's no kind of formal enforcement of a license. It is suggested that you put an all caps license text file in your project that will list, you know, whether it's new or GPL or MIT or any of those like It's not standard to enforce. No, there's like no automated enforcement or anything like that. It's just like a public repository of code. Yeah. And in fact, the GitHub, kind of the GitHub way is, um, it is almost public domain by default because every project has,
every project has at the top of the page a button that says fork. And when you click that, it takes that repository, clones it, and moves it into your account. So not only is there no enforcement of restrictive licenses, it's got kind of greased skids for you to take someone's project. And then the idea there is though, when you make changes to it, it's also another push button change to suggest the changes back upstream. So it's kind of, by default, it's meant to be an open source process. So there's definitely no restrictive license enforcement. Is there provisions for when somebody does Get your code, you know who gets it. Yes. Got it. There is uh, there is a lot of tracking of at least on GitHub. If you're talking about just plain Git, Git does. No, I mean GitHub. Stuff. But GitHub will show, like they show kind of like a like a, a branching <coughs> line chart where they'll show here's the main line and then here someone forked it and started playing with it and they could show it merge back in and things like that. So GitHub very kind of meticulously tracks who has what code. So does that answer your question about the, the license stuff? It sounds like uh, if you didn't publish a license, you're protected by copyright. Yeah. And nobody can take it. Yeah. It's kind of loosey-goosey, though, which I think is, in some sense, terrible, but it is also kind of an informal license in that if it's on GitHub, fork it. So that's kind of the informal cultural thing, is that on one sense, I think in the strictest sense, if you're talking about default copyright, that shouldn't be happening. but. The understanding is basically if you've put it in the public repo, it's open season for anyone to contribute or take it or play with it. So how do you think of uh, if they came to court? Yeah. Lawyer <coughs> or if like if they're putting it on a site, the business model is, hey, free, share, take, yeah. play, explore. But of course, I'm not a lawyer, so I have no idea what it would actually do in court. But I, but yeah, that's, I would assume that would be what would happen is it's kind of meant to be a public exchange of coding and coding activities and contributing to each other's projects. Um, and like I said, the if you want to take it private, that's where you pay. So a private project doesn't show up in the public listings. And I don't think a private project can be taken public. So like if you have access to a private project, they can't be forked. Yeah, I think well, I think you could fork it, but it inherits the privacy. Like you have to be on that person's team and you have to be part of because they also have organizations on the site. So I think if it's private and you're in the organization, when you fork it, it stays private. And so you can't take it public. Because you can grant it permission to fork it. Yeah. You, you can put access control on it. Yeah. So I think insofar as there are restrictions, that's the only one is that I think if you pay monthly for the project, you can keep it kind of dark and private to a certain degree. <coughs> quite a few. I'm trying to think. There's almost too many for me to name. I know um, at Mozilla, we've been slowly moving from our own in-house yet public source code repositories. And one by one, they've been switching over to GitHub because it's just kind of the thing that a lot of coders are doing now. Um, like one of our projects, actually one of our biggest projects is uh, Boot to Gecko, which is the Firefox phone operating system, that is mostly on GitHub. Um, and it's kind of a, the, the whole fork and pull request model is something that we just kind of have naturally done for years anyway, so it kind of slid naturally into it. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's another major project that isn't my work. No, it's, not there. it's not what I want. Okay, so I can go into the, the next part of my cloud computer here, which is Heroku. Is there anyone familiar with Heroku? A couple of people. So, as you're probably familiar, the, to put an app in the cloud, you're going to need a server. If you're going to build like a PHP app or some kind of web, I'm very web app focused, so that's what I'm focusing on. Heroku is a cloud provider of servers. So you can build a web app and with a single button push, you can push it into Heroku's cloud. Uh, and one of the coolest things, speaking of wiring up a hobby computer, Heroku offers this purple button. 
And it's a very simple thing. You put this hyperlink in the readme to your project, and you write a short descriptive, uh, machine readable descriptive file in your project. And when you push this button, it goes into a pre filled control panel, which then you can click another button, and you have a running application. And the thing that's really neat about that is one of the, the first kind of obstacles that contributors to any project, or even me, years after I stopped working on one of my own things, is trying to remember how to install something I was working on. And the neat thing about this is I can go from a repository to a running application in probably two button clicks. And the thing about Heroku is that for a hobbyist level of usage, I'm talking maybe hundreds to thousands of visits per month, maybe not even that much, Heroku has a free tier that will work perfectly fine. So you can try out new experiments, push in the Heroku from GitHub. Um, but even better, to go even further down this hobby computer road, you can wire all three of these things I just talked about together. So when I make a change in my project, I store it up on GitHub, it goes through Travis, which runs all my tests. Travis says, OK, your project hasn't broken. And then it can automatically update my server with the latest version of my code. And that's all wired together with these uh, uh, webhook APIs. When you go to upload the improvement to your uh, the little thingy you want to attach, I know there's a name for it, and I forgot to do it. Does it only update your portion that you have made a copy to, or does it try and update everything that you grabbed and put in on the outside? Oh, you mean like. Um, Syncing the code. Yeah, or do you mean like if my code uses someone else's code kind of thing? Uh, Are you talking no. about like no. a board? What I'm, what I'm wondering is uh, let's say that there's an app out there called ABC Clock. Huh? And you think it's a real cool clock, so it's going to be one of the really cool clocks that you change a little bit to get into your app. Yeah. Is that going to have any effect whatsoever on the little app that you pulled in and stuck on? Oh, you mean like the original yeah. thing that I borrowed? No. So it'll just be, that's what the, uh, so on GitHub the term forking, and it's a pretty common open source thing, is like I have taken a copy of their code, mm -hmm. and I my copy can't influence the original at all. And the only way I can influence the original is by pushing my changes, suggesting, submitting my changes back. So I'm kind of in my own isolated version of it. But it runs as you choose to change it. Yes. Yeah. And after you fork it, it doesn't change. Even if they change their yeah, exactly. Back, yours stays the same. Yeah, exactly. So that's where I would have to keep pulling updates from their original repository and development line. Um, so does that, does that answer your question about whether I, okay. And am I speaking louder? Has my, has my volume gotten no. up? No? <laughs> okay, I'll try a little better. Well, part of it is the noise outside the door. And if I can put a big Yeah. I'm also kind of hiding in the corner of the room, too. Okay, moving over a little more. Okay, so. So this is kind of my evaluation slide here where I want to talk about how does this fit the criteria I talked about at the start. So GitHub, freeze and beer, that's cool. Works for my hobby applications. Works with GitHub and Travis CI, so I can wire it up like those chips in the hobby computer. Uh, my code works everywhere. It worked on the same code that I put into GitHub that I ran on Travis CI. That code runs in Heroku. So that stays mine. I can fix it. I can take it with me. Uh, the one downside with the free tier of Heroku is that if you haven't accessed your app in a little while, they shut it down. What's a little while? Like uh, a few hours. But, then, but what's, what the shutdown means though, which is actually fine in practice, is that when you go to access it again, it automatically starts back up. But the, the only annoyance is that that startup could be 
Oh, it just they just stop it running. Yeah, they, they just they, they hibernate it. it. Yeah, they don't delete it. They hibernate it, and it can be a little annoying when you come back to it. It might take thirty to thirty seconds to five minutes for it to respond again. Um, so there, there's an incurred start of latency there. Yeah, that's where they they start up some servers for you and they warm up some caches and they do all this stuff that if you if you set the the catch to free, is if you pay you get dedicated resources that just stay on. So